Hi, today I'm going to give you a tour of the parser architecture in BAML's new incremental toolchain with a focus on the concrete syntax tree, or CST. There's a lot to cover, so come on, let's get started. Oh, oh you, you want to do it over here? That's fine, we can keep it over here. We don't have to move. To understand the CST, we'll focus on three things. How we produce it, what it is, how we consume it. We produce a CST by calling parse file with cache to parse a stream of tokens. What is a token? It's a single piece of text from an input file. Our parser's tokens correspond to grammatically interesting chunks of text, like a single word, a block of white space, a single bracket, or an operator. We also define tokens for keywords in the BAML language, like function and if, since the parser will give those tokens special treatment. The process of breaking an input file into a list of tokens is called lexing, and we use the Logos library to implement our lexer. Let's see lexing in action. We have golden tests under BAML tests, and you can see that for this example input BAML file, we have this lexer output. You can also use a tool called BAML onion skin to get an interactive view on the different compiler passes like lexing. Here we see the BAML file on the left and its corresponding lex on the right. If you want to see how a change to the BAML file would impact the lex, take a snapshot and edit the file. Let's come back to our parse file with cache function. The second parameter is node cache, and the return type is a pair of green node and a vec of parse error. The node cache is something the parser will use to store parsed expressions. When an expression or sub-expression gets parsed, it gets stored in the cache. That way, multiple occurrences of the same node can be shared, saving memory. Now, the return type. Rather than returning a result of green node or parse error, the parser returns a tuple of green node and a vec of parse errors. This is a theme you'll see over and over in the new compiler toolchain. When something unexpected happens during any phase, we don't just give up and return an error. We return as much valid compiler output as possible alongside a list of errors. That's how we'll continue to be able to serve information like autocomplete and type under cursor even when a function is in a half-written state and has syntax errors. Finally, the last piece of the type signature, the green node. What's that? The red-green algorithm was developed by the Rosalind team for the C-sharp parser. It has green nodes and red nodes. In our parser, these come from the Rowan library, which calls green nodes green nodes and red nodes syntax nodes. Green nodes are nodes in a syntax tree that are immutable and fully self-contained. Red nodes are views into green nodes that give the green nodes context. You can view a green node through a red node to get the absolute positions of the sub-expressions within the green node. If you have a red node that contains several green nodes in a sequence, you can swap the orders of the green nodes without invalidating the green nodes. That's what it means for them to be self-contained. Why are they called red and green? Those are the colored markers the Rosalind team had in their conference room when they designed the algorithm. So why do we want this kind of structure to represent our syntax trees? There's two big reasons. First, we need a CST, not an AST. We're going to be writing these syntax trees back into files, and that means that we need to keep track of all the white spaces and comments so that we don't lose those when we do that writing. Green nodes have an efficient internal structure for representing all that data. Second, we need to support incremental parsing. That means at some point we're going to be able to say insert these new characters between lines 15 and 16. Most of the green nodes before line 15 and most of the green nodes after line 16 won't be affected by that insertion and we want to be able to slide them around in the file without invalidating them. That's exactly what the green node structure gives us. The next thing to get familiar with is how we parse the token stream into the CST. CST nodes are untyped, meaning that they have the same Rust type. To tell them apart, they carry a value level syntax kind tag. Let's look at that tag. You can see we have tags for keywords, control flow keywords, punctuation, operators. It looks a lot like uh, tokens from the lexer. 
except that we also have syntax tags for composite nodes, like function def, which would contain the entire definition of a function, and class def, which is the entire definition of a class. So how does parsing actually work? Parsing is implemented on top of a parser struct, which is a stateful view into the parsing process. It contains a list of tokens and the current token in focus, and a list of events. The implementation of the struct contains functions that parse individual syntax forms from the BAML language. Let's look at a concrete example. This method of that same parser parses field attributes, for example, at the attribute name and then any parameters of the attribute. We're finally going to see some low-level parsing methods that work inside this parser. We have a method called with node, which starts a new green node with a specific syntax kind tag, and also defines a callback for how to populate the children of that node. To populate the children of the attribute node, we're first going to expect the at token. What expect means is that we consume that one token from the stream and we push it into the event stream underneath the particular syntax node that we're working on. Next we use at, which is a peaking operation that checks the value of the next token without consuming it. And for field attribute parsing, we see that we're checking that the next token is a word. If it is a word, we call bump, otherwise we emit an error and continue. What does bump do? Bump consumes one token and emits one new event un under the syntax node that we're currently building. Finally, we check if we're at a left paren, which signifies the beginning of the argument list, and then we defer to a subfunction called parse attribute args. So here's where we're recursively descending into another parser method. I don't know about you, but I'm curious to see if all that worked. So let's go back to onion skin, and we're going to look at the parser output. So we've defined our class foo before, and we'll add name. We'll refresh this snapshot, and we want to see what changes when we go ahead and add a field attribute. Alias name. So we see that we got some new syntax nodes. We got an attribute, white space, at, the word alias, and our attribute args, which came from the subfunction that we deferred to with our recursive descent parser. The very last thing that we do to get our CST is to iterate over all those events that we built up in the event stream and call the green node builder methods to turn those events into the nodes themselves. The events are all either tokens, which are leaves in the CST, or they're compound nodes, which can construct other nodes and have children. The iterator over those events that builds green nodes is very straightforwardly defined in parser.rs if you're interested to have a look. There's an important thing to keep in mind when you're writing these parsers yourself. If you hit an error case, it's important not to just leave that token on the stack. You have to eat it before you move on. Otherwise, the other parsers are going to see it, not know what to do, and you might just recurse forever seeing that token failing and, uh, and never making progress. You finally understand how the CST works. Congratulations! Holy shit! Now the very last topic is what we do with the CST once we have it. As you might expect, the natural thing after constructing the CST is to build an AST. One difference between the incremental compiler world and the traditional compiler world with respect to ASTs is that you don't generally need to materialize them with incremental compilers. Instead, we just think of them as views on top of the CST. So here is how it works. We have a trait called BAML AST node that will implement for everything that is a node of the AST. And then we're going to use a macro to create a whole lot of different AST node types. Here's a small sample. Source file is an AST type, function def is an AST type, etc. And what we do for each of those Rust structs that we've just defined is we impl them in a way that's appropriate for each syntax element. So for the AST element of function def, we want to be able to get the function def's name. And we do that by looking at the children of our own syntax node, and then using a heuristic, namely the first word in the children after the word function, 
is going to be this function's name. You follow the same pattern for all the other AST node types in the entire language. Congratulations on completing this course in the BAML parser. Please choose the certificate that you prefer using Command Shift 4 to screenshot whichever one you like. Save it to the desktop and be sure to present it with any pull requests you make to the BAML repo about the parser. Thank you.